Welcome back. So glad you're joining us again for Biblical Anthropology. Hope you've been enjoying this class so far. I know that I've been enjoying teaching it to you. My name is Pastor Jason Huffman, and today is week three of this course. And today we're going to talk about the idea and the concept and the incredible power of language. Language is our subject. So let me ask you, what is language? That may seem like a silly question because here we are communicating back and forth, although it's through a video, whatever format you're engaging in, it's still communication. I'm sharing language, you're receiving the language. But language is a lot more when you begin to look at it at, its, at, the, at the core of, of the value that it presents to a culture. And remember, we're viewing our biblical anthropology course through one of the specific lenses of culture. How does anthropology and culture go hand in hand? And what does the Bible have to say about it? Well, when it comes to language, you and I both know that language is a fundamental part of life. Without it, life would be so incredibly different. As a matter of fact, it's a fundamental part of the Word of God. If you go to Genesis, that's an easy one. I don't know how familiar you are with your Bible, but you just have to open up the front cover and turn a few pages. And there you are in Genesis. Right out of the gate, the very first chapter in your Bible says that God said time after time after time again, as God was creating the universe and everything in it, it says that God, and here's your first blank today, said, God said, God spoke, God used language. Now, we don't necessarily know what it was, the type of language that he was using there, but obviously he was saying something in a particular form of language. And when he spoke, things happened. They came into existence. The earth was formed. You and I, the, the, the core of who we are, male and female, were made at the sound of his voice. Then if you go all the way to the New Testament, in John chapter 1, we see that this idea of language presents itself again. It says, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. Word is the fill in the blank for you right there in John 1, chapters 1 through 5. And it says in verse 3 that through him, the Word, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Isn't it interesting that Jesus is connected to the concept of word, the word, words being a, a, a foundational part of any language. And this word, Jesus, that came into the darkness was not understood by the darkness. That there, there's a message, Jesus himself is the word. And yet we can confuse, we can misunderstand, we cannot comprehend the word. And then if you jump into Acts chapter 2, in verse 3, we have the day of, the day of Pentecost when all are gathered in the upper room and they're praying and the Holy Spirit visits them. And it says in Acts chapter 2 verse 3, they saw tongues of fire. Isn't that interesting? The tongue, uh, an, a, a, a tool for language to be used to communicate is also shown here representing the Holy Spirit. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all connected in this idea of language. It says in Scripture, and to each other, they are connected in language and, this is your next fill in the blank, images of language, tongue, the word, all of that kind of stuff. So all living things on earth communicate. Think about it. Even plants communicate to a degree. It may not be the kind of communication that you and I are engaging in right now, but they communicate. It's human language that is unique and distinct in many, many different ways. Language is one of the most significant ways in which humans and animals are very and vastly different. Different. I mean, think about it. I have a wonderful puppy at home. Really, he's not my puppy. He's my wife's dog, um, and he reminds me of that. Whenever she's not around, he's miserable. And I think, well, what am I, chopped liver? 
He might like me better if I was chopped liver. He's a dog. But anyways, uh, we get along okay, and he's at home, and I try to communicate with him. Maybe because it's my background in psychology, I try to mess with his head and mess him up, and maybe that's why he likes my wife better. I don't know why. But anyways, me and this dog, we get along okay, and I try to engage in communication. And sometimes it's frustrating because I realize that this dog, as smart as he is, and he's a smart puppy, um, his ability to communicate is so different from mine. His one bark, now there are many barks that he makes that I can pinpoint what they are, but sometimes they all just sound like a bark and I have no idea what he wants and I get frustrated because I want him to stop barking. I wonder from his perspective what I sound like, right? Maybe I sound like the mom in the, uh, in, in the Peanuts cartoon, wah, 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 right? And he's just watching my body language and that's the communication that he's connecting with. Where are my eyes going? What am I doing and all those kind of things. The point is, is that human beings and animals communicate very differently. It's one of the great differences between the two of us. Letter B, language is a system designed for transmitting and receiving information. That's basically what language boils down to. It's a system designed for transmitting and receiving information. It can include both verbal and nonverbal components, such as sounds, gestures, symbols, and other methods. According to the United States Census Bureau, as of 2013, there were at least 350 languages spoken in the U.S. alone. Did you hear that? In 2013, the U.S. Census Bureau determined that there were over 350 languages spoken, not in the world, just in the United States. As of 2009, the Linguistic Society of America estimated that the world had at least 6,000 909 distinct languages. Almost 7,000 languages in the world. Those statistics are mind-boggling to me. I can accept, you know, maybe 300 languages in the world, but the reality that there's almost 7,000 languages, distinct languages that are spoken around the world. Could life exist without verbal written language? Ask yourself that question. That's your next blank. Could life exist without verbal or written language? Me, you might be able to argue that maybe it could, but it probably wouldn't thrive. Be very different than the way things are today between you and I. Matter of fact, I believe it was Helen Keller who was not only blind, but she was deaf and she couldn't speak. She experienced all three of those tragedies. And when asked if she could have one of those back, which would she prefer? Would she have her eyesight back? Would she have the ability to speak back or the ability to hear? Or another way of putting it is, which one of those did she feel was the most um, difficult to experience? Maybe ask yourself that. If you could have only one of those three, the ability to speak, the ability to hear, the ability to see, which one would you choose? I think most people would probably choose eyesight. They'd want to be able to see. You know which one that she chose? She said the ability to hear. Because not being able to hear disconnected her from everybody. Not being able to hear, transmit, and receive information through language totally affected the way that she experienced her world. Cooperation and communication would be nearly impossible if we didn't have forms of language. So here's an opportunity for you to discuss. And let me ask you this question. Can you think of a way in which both animals and humans use language in each of the following ways? So you're gonna fill in the blank and I want you to think about it. These are ways in which both animals and humans use language in each of the following ways. Number one, sound. How do animals and humans use sound? as language. I mean, so for humans, what, what's one? I mean, obviously, vocal cords, speaking, of course. That's a simple one, right? What about for animals? How do animals use sound? I mean, my dog barks, birds chirp, crickets, whatever crickets do, you know? 
So animals are using sound, humans are using sound, similar but very different. What about this one, your second blank, sight? How do humans and animals use their sight, their vision, to communicate? I mean, for human beings, what? What's one way? I'm communicating here. I guess I have my hand in my pocket. I don't know if you can see it. Kind of casual, you know? I wave my hands around a lot, you know? Make, make gestures. You're, you're able to see that. That communicates something, right? They, they, they teach us, you know, in counseling, your body language is very important because if you're listening to somebody like this, it communicates you're closed off, you're not very interested in what they're, they're hearing, but if you, if you lean forward, yeah, you know, engaged, making eye contact, you're visually letting them know that, that you're communicating, you're here, you're there. What about animals? You know, somebody once told me, and I experimented with this, I, I've had cats as well as dogs, you know, as, as pets in my life, and Somebody told me that animals, especially cats, they were using in the context of cats, communicate with their eyes. So for, for a long time, I tried to communicate to my cats just with my eyes. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. You know, different blinks and all of that. But they do. I, I, I noticed with my dog, I can, I can get him riled up in a heartbeat. And if I avert my, gla my gaze, if I look at a particular way, boom, he wants to go take off and go that direction. Why? Because he's following my eyes. He's communicating. What about tail wagging? You know, a dog or cat wags their tail because they, they let you know that they're feeling a particular way. These are ways in which both animals and humans use language. Um, another one is smell. That's your next blank, smell. How do humans use smell as a language? Um, you probably can't smell it, but I'm wearing cologne right now. If that cologne was offensive to you, the, the communication you would be receiving from the smell of my cologne would not be positive. Now, I, I, um, if you're married or you have a significant other in your life, I'm going to give you a good piece of advice when it comes to smell. You may like a cologne or a perfume that you wear, but if you're married, just ask them, hey, I was going to buy this. What do you think of that? And if they say, oh, I hate that, <laughs> even if you like it, don't get it. If they say, oh, I love it, even if you're like, eh, get it. You want to smell good to the people that care about you in your life. The humans use smell. What about pheromones? You ever heard of pheromones? They're these, these almost imperceptible uh, signals, communications that are sent, that we receive through our olfactory senses, right? That communicate uh, different things about our physiology. You know, there's a lot of studies on those kind of things. What about for animals? It's the same. They use similar things in their way of communicating. And then finally, touch. All these senses, right? So touch, what, what, are, what are a way in which, which both animals and humans respond to touch? Well, I mean, it could be different one way or the other. I know my dog, he loves it when I pet him. He really does. But another way that, 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 that animals use touch is ants or, or insects. They, you know, using their antenna, antenna and just kind of communicating back and forth with those touches. Also, when it comes to smell, animals, chemically, they'll lay down a trail. And they'll follow that, you know, as well. What about human beings? This is an odd one. You know, I mean, well, I mean, I, I, from time to time I'll play softball with our church team or the church league or something like that. And, and one of the odd ways that guys in sports, you know, communicate through a touch is smacking somebody right on the rear. You know, I don't know what culture you're from, but in the United States, if you're in a sporting event and you're playing, that's relatively acceptable. Anywhere else, not so much. Um, so be careful how you use that one in touch. But there's many different. What, what about some other ways? What are the ways that you can think of in which human beings and animals communicate um, that are similar or dissimilar? What about spiritually? Do you ever think about that? Um, how people communicate spiritually. You know, when you get married, the Bible says that the two become one. And I know that uh, there have been times in my relationship with my wife where I really feel like we're really communicating spiritually. We don't necessarily have to be saying anything, using words, or even holding hands or anything like that. It's just there's something in the spirit that I can sense, we can both sense, that we're communicating, we're, we're joined. So many different ways that language can be used. And these are just a few of the questions that are considered and asked by, by anthropologists in the field of linguistics. Linguistics is your next blank there. 
So let's look at Roman numeral two here and talk about historical linguistics. Where did linguistics come from? Historical linguistics. It's the study of how languages develop and change over time and how different languages are related to one another. Scholars have studied languages for thousands of years. We have texts of Egyptian hieroglyphs that have been chiseled on ancient stone, right? There are Sanskrit writings on animal hides dating from as far back as 2000 BC. In the Qumran caves, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. They made it possible to compare languages from different cultures over different times. All of this comes under the field of linguistics. We have linguistic morphology, M-O-R-P-H-O-L-O-G-Y, morphology. What linguistic morphology basically is, is the study of patterns and structures of words and language. Maybe you're fascinated by this field of study. There's a whole area of study in anthropology that deals with linguistics, with going back to the original texts of our scriptures, looking at how they were written, how they were copied, what was intended by the original author, how they've been translated over the years, and how they've come to be in your and my hand. Letter B, proto-language. Proto-language. A proto-language is an ancient language from which all other members of a particular language family are derived. So think of it as the mother and father language that is the source for all the branches of the different languages that come down. The Sumerians were an ancient people that were um, geographically positioned right around at the, at the top of the Persian Gulf there, where it comes into the Middle East. Right there is Sumeria, uh, ancient Sumeria. And the Sumerians who lived there were believed to have settled there as far back as 3500 BC in the Mesopotamian area. And that is some of the oldest forms of writing that we have ever uncovered as far as ancient historical linguistics. It's called cuneiform. And cuneiform was basically they would take a, a wet piece of clay and they would make indentions in it using reeds or different tools. And they would create, and, and then they would, they would let it dry, and then they, they would have a tablet that had all these shapes and forms on it. 3500 BC, we've uncovered some of these incredible ancient languages. That language would be considered a proto-language to maybe the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Our next blank is Latin. Latin. Maybe you could uh, study Latin at the school that you're at. Um, or maybe you're interested in languages and, and you've, you, you realize, you've seen, you've, you've heard of how important Latin is to English and to the other Romance languages in the world. It's considered a proto-language proto because from it come all the Romance languages. Let's see if I can get them all right. We have French, um, Romanian, Spanish, uh, Portuguese. Um, I don't remember the other one, but anyways... Uh, oh, Italian. So all the Romance languages, all these beautiful languages, right, come out of Latin. They've all kind of formed. And then even English has so many of its roots that tie back to the language of Latin. So Latin would be a proto-language. And then letter C, the study of societies through their text is called philology. P-H-I-L-O-L-O-G-Y. Philology. That's just the study of societies through their languages. How their language is used, how it's changed over time, and all this stuff can help anthropologists understand more about the life that the people of that culture experienced. Their social interactions, their religion interactions, their politics, all of those kind of things. Let's look at this next area, descriptive linguistics, as we continue to explore languages and its importance to cultural anthropology. The study of specific features of individual languages, such as patterns of grammar, and sound is called descriptive linguistics. That's simple, right? Linguistics, language, descriptive, analyzing the different descriptives of language. Some of the basic elements of descriptive linguistic study are, number one, phenomes, P-H-O-N-E-M-E-S. So these are specific structures and sounds in a language. For example, on your notes there, I have the letter B in English makes the sound B. That makes sense, right? The letter T, T. The letter A, A. And some different ones. If you learn language phonetically, 
then that's how you were taught the English language. That makes sense. And phonetics is the second one. Phonetics, P-H-O-N-E-T-I-C-S. This is all the possible structures and sounds in a language. So you start to put all these things together and, and what linguistic anthropologists do is they go and they look at the language at its, at its basic elements and they break it down. And it's amazing the kind of things you can learn about a culture and a people from these things. The next element of linguistics is morphemes. M-O-R-P-H-E-M-E-S. Morphemes. These are combinations of, pho of, of pho phonemes to form units that carry meaning. B plus A plus T is B at. B at, right? So you're learning language. You're learning how to speak language. Then the next one is grammar. Now we get into some of the ones that you're more familiar with, that we're more familiar with. Grammar. These are the rules that people use to organize speech. The rules that people use. To organize. And then the next one is syntax. Syntax. S-Y-N-T-A-X. This is the order in which the morphemes appear. So some examples here in your notes. You could do the, the boy swung the bat. That's a perfectly great illustration of a, a, a sentence that makes sense linguistically. Or you could say the bat was swung by the boy. That makes sense too, but it's rearranging the words. Or you can say by the boy, the bat was swung. All three different orders, different organizing of the speech, the syntax, still each one makes sense. So which is the correct syntax? Well, all of them are correct. So you can see the complexity of understanding languages when it comes to this level of linguistics and digging down deep into each one of those. Now, I don't know about you, but English was not my favorite subject in school. I just pushed my way through it, especially when it came to grammar. Grammar was so brutal for me, it was not my favorite. The only um, other class that I think would put lower on the list would probably be calculus. Forget it, don't wanna go there. Um, but when you begin, just this broad kind of overview of how important language is and how specific each of the elements of language can be used to explore what language means and how it impacts a culture and how people use it and what they mean when they say it. Now you take that and step back and you apply that to the Word of God and you understand how important it is to have a good translation how important it is to understand exactly what it is the authors were intending and meeting. You see, God created language, and he created you and I with the capacity to use language, to communicate, to transfer information. And he himself uses language. The Bible is filled with ex examples and illustrations, even in Genesis, when God says, it's speaking in, in the form of, of the Godhead in heaven, let's go down and make man in our image. Who's he talking to? He's using language in the heavens. The whole earth is full of his glory and it proclaims that his praises. And so language and communication is such an important part of our culture and who we are. And so vital to understand who we are, who God is, and where we're going. Letter B, one of the important qualities of language is that language is adaptable. Missionary linguistics face the challenge of learning, defining, and organizing the many elements of languages in order to translate the gospel and God's word into various forms of communication found in the world today. I have a friend of mine who's an incredible pastor and musician, and his mission in life is to go to places in the world where they don't have worship in their own language and to translate worship music into their language, into their style and form of musical communication, and then to help them to learn how to write their own music and to create their own worship in their native tongue. Oh, such an incredible, powerful, amazing thing. And the degree to which he understands language and he understands music is so incredible and it's really helped him. But I love the stories that he tells me about the way in which he's had to adapt to meet certain challenges, and he's had to allow others to adapt, to, to, to allow them to come in and to create their own sound and to adapt to, to the different forms that he was presenting them and to create boundaries that were loose. And he would tell these incredible stories of how beautiful music was created, music that he never heard before by people who were just learning how to play particular instruments and learning just the structure of the communication of worship and language and writing music. Really, really awesome. 
So let me ask you, when it comes down to language, and you may have some pretty incredible opinions on this, but which translation of the Bible is the best or most accurate one? I mean, think about that. It comes your Bible. I mentioned earlier before, I read the NIV a lot. That's the one I'm using here in this course. I've got so many translations of the Bible at my house and my office and uh, different places I go. If you have an iPhone, man, or, or any kind of device, Android or whatever, you have access to practically every Bible translation that's out there. Which one is the best? What do you think? Don't fight over it. I, I heard a preacher one time says, I'm going to read from the King James Version, or as it's most commonly referred to, the Holy Bible, the only one. There's so many different translations out there, especially today. I would say the answer to that question is the most accurate translation is the one that remains truest to what the original authors were trying to communicate. That's the best translation. And linguistics can help in that endeavor. Example, for instance, what if somebody a thousand years from now were to read your journal or maybe to read some of your reading responses from the last week? I hope you did that as your homework. But they were reading that. And in, in there, you were writing down, and you were using this idiom, a form of language, and you said, you know, today was great except for the fact that it rained cats and dogs. Now, not many people use that phrase anymore, it rained cats and dogs, but maybe you're familiar with it. It simply means that it rained horribly. There's like torrential downpour, right? Maybe you're more familiar with like, it just, it, it rained buckets today. Now you're, now, 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 now take yourself, imagine you're a thousand years in the future and you've stumbled across these writings from somebody that was like you that wrote in our day and age, but you're totally removed from that culture and you're reading and you read in there, today it rained cats and dogs. And you think to yourself, wow, what a miracle. Dogs and cats were falling from the sky or buckets were falling from the sky. You can see how important it is to be able to understand what you, a thousand years earlier, were trying to communicate in what you were writing. Cats and dogs weren't falling from the sky. It was raining very heavily. But in the course of time, in our example that thousand years, that idiom, that example, that illustration had lost its meaning. It didn't exist anymore. So now somebody way, way over here is completely confused or completely thrown off by that communication. It's possible that that can happen. That's why it's so important for us to understand exactly what it was that the, the, the authors of the scriptures were communicating to us here today. So I would encourage you, when it comes to translations, read a lot of different translations. And look at how they, they're, they're different and how they're similar. Um, if you're going to choose a translation, go maybe to a bookstore and read a, a verse that you like a lot that you're familiar with in different translations. And you'll get an idea of what the difference is between them and all of that. But as we get back to our notes here, uh, number four, Roman numeral number four, let's look at some major theories of language. We're just gonna cruise through this here so we can get through some of this material today and uh, sh share some of the things that we have coming up. But in comparison to other forms of communication found in the animal kingdom, human language is a very complex system. Even the simplest form of human communication can be challenging to learn. Have you ever tried to learn Pig Latin? Ie, uye, te, I don't even know. I mean, that's simple, right? You just kind of switch things around, but that can even be challenging, let alone trying to learn, let's say, Hebrew, where they read everything from, from left to right, you know? Uh, wait a minute, we read them from left to right. I'm trying to do it backwards for you. So they read it from le right to left, you know? So it's written backwards, all that, compared to us, that's not typical for us and how, how we would read. And they're using different symbols and all that, or Chinese maybe difficult languages to learn. As a result, theories of the origins of languages and how languages evolved are numerous and diverse. In the Bible, we see, Roman numeral A, or letter A, that languages were present in the Garden of Eden. Language was present in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.16 says, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. What language was he speaking? Obviously, God was speaking something and mankind, Adam, had the capacity to receive that information, to process it and understand, and know what he should or should not do. Don't eat at the tree. Maybe it wasn't communicated very clearly. Well, that's heresy, I guess. But it was communicated very clearly from God, but maybe there's some breakdown in communication with Adam because he ended up eating from the tree, the one thing he wasn't supposed to do. But anyways, there's communication, there's language going on. 
Later on, it says that man said, after Eve is presented, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. What was he talking about? What was he saying? What language was he using? He was expressing himself in the reality of the beauty of Eve and the relationship that they had in God. And then in Genesis 3, chapter 1, it says, the serpent said to the woman, did God really say? Listen to that. They have the serpent talking and saying, did God really say? All this language interacting. Letter B, language has been part of humanity's growth and development. Growth and development. Genesis 11, verse 1, says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. What? At one point, the entire world spoke the same language. Isn't that something? I wonder what that was. Probably wasn't English. Anyways, moving on. Genesis 11, 6 through 7, then says, The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Man, language has been a part of humanity for a long, long time, the very beginning. And then letter C, structuralism. Let's look at what this means. A Swiss scholar named Ferdinand de Saucer, I can't pronounce his last name, de Saucer, applied scientific methods to study language theory. Structuralism, number one, hypothesized that all language shared a basic structure and could be understood through how the words were related to one another. <clears throat> number two, he conceived of language as having a binary structure. In other, in other words, your computer communicates with zeros and ones, binary, right? So he thought of language as having a binary structure. And this binary structure was found in the forms of pairs and opposites, pairs and opposites. So he could break down any language into its pairs and opposites, hot and cold, uh, up and down, light and dark, table. The table is a table. It's not a chair or a couch, all these kind of things. He was able to create a formula called structuralism that broke language down into these parts. Number three, structuralism also hypothesized that words have a surface meaning, a surface meaning, and a symbolic meaning. So this idea of structuralism is not only can you break language down into different parts, but it has different meanings depending on the layer that you're looking at it. If you're married or you've ever dated somebody, regardless of whether you're male or female, you know that there are breakdowns in communication between the differences there. And uh, sometimes things have a surface meaning and they have a deeper meaning. And it's important to know which is. That'll be a big benefit for your relationship if you're able to discern, is that a surface meaning or is this a deeper meaning? Language. Structuralism, number, um, number three, was carried and expanded upon by Noam Chomsky, a very famous psychologist, a very famous theorist, and he took this theory, structuralism, further and applied mathematical principles to it. There's your blank, mathematical principles. So Chomsky realized, okay, if there's a binary structure here, if it's got different forms of meaning and I can break it down into mathematical principles, then I can, he could determine the range of sounds and grammar that was possible for a particular language. It's an incredible discovery. And he used it to apply it to different forms of language. And he even studied the brain and how the different parts of the brain connected, processed, and interacted when it came to language. Chomsky's work enabled anthropologists to understand culture. Your next blank there is culture, better through the use of languages. So let's look at a couple, uh, another hypothesis here, uh, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Now these two guys, they developed another theory of language that was different than structuralism. They saw language and culture as existing in a dynamic, your blank there, a dynamic relationship with one another. So in other words, they, they took all this work and they realized that, okay, language and culture really work together. They play off one another. The Sapir War Theory opened the door to understanding language as part of a social, that's your blank, and cultural, your other blank setting. So this theory looked at language and connected the dots between language and culture and how they impacted one another. Out of this came this thing called sociolinguistics. Sociolinguistics is the study of how culture and language influence one another. Influence one another. In your text, it says culture is not just a reflection of language. Culture changes language. Think about that. Language is just not a part of your culture. You, you were raised in a, in a Hispanic culture, so you speak Spanish, and you speak a particular dialect of that Spanish. It's not just because you're a part of that culture that you speak that language. 
that culture that you're in has changed language. You could take English, the way I speak it here in North Florida, and take the same English and go to inner city New York, and you might not be able to understand one another when speaking with somebody who has a particular form of language. That culture has changed it. It has adapted. It has done something unique to it. Language shapes how people think and behave. Language shapes how people think and behave. So what I'd like for you to do now, as we get ready to close out this class, is I have a link there to uh, a TED uh, Talks episode um, uh, on, uh, online there. So if you're viewing online, I'd love for you to take some time and click that link and watch this incredible TED Talk. Um, if not, maybe you're in a classroom setting, maybe the instructor um, has prepared to, to view this here today in their notes, and uh, you can watch that. If neither of those is possible, I want to encourage you to watch this when you get home or you get to a place where you can watch it. Some fascinating uh, insight into the power of language and how language shapes the way that you and I think. Very, very profound. After you've watched that, uh, come on back to the video here and uh, we'll continue on. Um, if you're going to watch it at home, um, that's great too. Now I want to go ahead and continue on in Roman numeral 6. Relationships between culture, language, and society. Letter A, multilingual. What is a multilingual society? Multilingual societies are where multiple languages are spoken. They're more common today than ever before. Think about your culture. Think about where you live. I guarantee you it's probably, in a, to a great degree, multilingual. Current phenomenon such as global immigration, that's your next blank, global immigration, and advanced technology, your next blank, have removed traditional barriers that cross exposure of languages from one people group to another. So in other words, the barriers that used to limit the exposure of languages from different cultures are coming down. And cultures are experiencing a cross exposure of different languages and experiencing growth in technology. Ask yourself this question, do you speak any other, any other language than the language you were born with? Maybe you do, maybe you learned it in high school, and, uh, and, and you forgot all about her. Maybe you were born into a multilingual family and you've been taught that. How familiar are you with the other language or other languages? Are you familiar enough to communicate with them? What sort of impact has language diversity had on your life? I don't recall who said it, but they said um, they were talking about language and the power of language and how important it was from their perspective that every person learn a second language. And their, their concept wrapped in this idea that language affects how we think and behave was basically, I'm gonna paraphrase this idea that um, having one language is good, but having a second language gives you a whole new and fresh way at viewing the world. So from their opinion, it was so powerful and important for everybody to experience the world through a different language than the one they were born with. It kind of communicates the power of language. Let's close today with talking about language and scripture very briefly. How we read and understand, those are your two blanks there, how we read and understand scripture is critically affected by language and language theory. The Bible is commonly referred to as the word of God, right? It's the word of God, there's language. Linguistic anthropologists can offer important insight into approaching and understanding Scripture. We're encouraged by Scripture to not only be hearers of the Word, but also doers of the Word as well, right? Letter B, God is continuing, continuing to reveal Himself through the Scriptures. I love that the Word of God is living and active. That's something I read last year about this time. I can read again this year about this time. And the Lord will speak something so profoundly unique and wonderful to me that I didn't receive last time. This is living and active. God is continuing to reveal himself through scriptures, through Jesus Christ, the word, and through the Holy Spirit who teaches and reveals Jesus to us. The ability to communicate the gospel to all people of the world is achievable. You can be a part of that. I know people that are doing that in the world today. They're Linguistic anthropologists spreading the word of God around the world. How communication, whether verbal, musical, art, or any other form is accomplished within the social context 
is more critical today than ever, and language plays a part. Maybe one of you will be the next great Christian anthropological linguist. That's a mouthful. Maybe you're interested in this field. You could be someone who could transform society by translating the Bible into other languages that don't have it or or connecting the reality of the scriptures to cultures through presenting the gospel in a language they understand. Wouldn't that be exciting and powerful? More likely having learned about the power of linguistics and the dynamics of it connecting to our culture here today, you'll experience at least all of us, whether we translate in other languages or not, which is probably not many of us, but you, you and I here today can appreciate with a greater depth the numerous ways in which humans communicate and how important language is to all of us. Thank you so much for joining me here today. So excited to be with you on this journey. Please make sure you look at the assignment for your reading and for your reading responses. And I'm looking forward to being with you next time, the next lesson for this class. Thank you so much.